Welcome to the podcast where I, Devin Pierce, bring you the tools of my toolbox. So whether you're a parent going to be one or just adulting, it is my goal to help you make you better equipped for the great adventure of life. Welcome to Dad's Class, the podcast edition. <laughs> We are live over at Mixer.com slash Dad's Class. I record live on Mixer. If you guys want to see some behind the scenes as to me stuttering, long pauses when I lose my spacing on my show notes, or well, just little odds and ends that don't make it into the final product of the show, come give us a follow. Say hi in the chat. I may not interact with you in the chat room while I'm recording, but I will get around to saying hi at some point. It is Christmas Eve. Merry Christmas. Happy Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, whatever. Happy Winter Solstice. Earlier today, I uh, was wearing a homemade ugly Christmas sweater, but uh, it wasn't warm enough. I had to put on my winter coat. Uh, the studio seems to collect cold air. Yeah. But and it is winter in Alberta. So trying to get this podcast going again during the busiest time of the year, the holiday season may have been a poor choice on my part. So for that, I'm sorry, because it has already caused some scheduling conflicts for us, and that's why we're doing a, a live stream on Christmas Eve to try and get another episode out before the end of December. <laughs> uh, but how are you guys? You know, I hope the holidays, whether you're wherever you're catching this, it's probably after the holidays, but I hope they were good. Uh, however it is that you did celebrate them or didn't. And I hope that you guys are looking forward to a positive new year coming up. Last class, we looked at the top five simple fun things for kids. We compared co-parenting with counter-parenting and parallel parenting. Our question of the week was, do you feel that enough is being done effectively to prepare high schoolers for having children? And earlier today, I streamed a top list for this week about holiday movies, which is up and live over on our YouTube channel. I have new sound bumpers. <laughs> So today's class is sign language, and perhaps we will answer the question, should you learn sign language? Well, the short answer to that question is definitely yes, but let's break it down a little bit, shall we? Today, I'm going to be talking to you through the benefits, and as well as some of the more popular myths and misconceptions about sign language. We're also going to touch on the differences, differences. We are also going to touch on the differences between sign language types that are used in North America, as well as I'm going to share with you guys some resources that I've been using myself. Now, we decided to look into sign language for our youngest uh, before he was born. And then, coincidentally, a friend of ours ended up having a child who was uh, born partially deaf. They originally thought he would be entirely deaf, but they have since discovered it's not so. And, you know, that just kind of, oh, we definitely should work on this with our son so that him and his buddy can sign with each other. That'd be pretty cool, you know. It's fun when your kids get to be friends with the kids of people you were friends with, right? So, you do what you can to help them out. <laughs> the first thing I would have to say with regards to 
learning to fingerspell, handspell in your language is understanding that you can do that. And for English people, we call that sign exact or sign supported English. However, the official languages for the deaf are languages, not speech on hands. Sign exact may have some similar uh, signs used, or even the same ones, but it is not the same thing as learning the language used by nonverbal members of your community. Additionally, where a person comes from is going to affect uh, how their hands move and their body language. Um, just from just from where you come from, right? You'll have different mannerisms, which you may have to overcome in order to learn a sign language. Even in sign exact English, or any language on your hands, you're going to see some variations on the signs the same way you have Canadian American and British English. There are American Sign Language, British Sign Language, Auslan, which is the uh, uh, Australian. I don't know why that was so hard for me to come up with. It's the uh, official language for the Australian deaf community. Is the official language for the Australian deaf community. And I'm also sure that there will be others for any other community that has uh, deaf members within it. Now, while linguistical study has always been a curiosity of mine, I've always been fascinated with languages and Oh, the way people talk to each other. It's, it's quite entertaining, really. Uh, it's, I am in no means an expert. Uh, I am also a very base-level novice with regards to my level of sign language learning. Just so we're all clear on where I stand on this. That being said, I have spent several days putting these notes together various resources, which I will link the most helpful ones in the description of today's episode. First and foremost, let's look at the myths around sign language. The big one, which I, I'm guilty of, I thought in my mind, at, at least some point, that there was only one sign language that was like universally used by everybody. That's not true. Not only is that not true, uh, one website I found, which was based in the UK, talked about specifically how American Sign Language and British Sign Language, or ASL and BSL, though both associated with English in their as their oral counterparts, they only share 31% of the signs used. I also learned that ASL, American Sign Language, is more based off of the grammatical structure of French because it is an adaptation that evolves separately from the French Sign Language. But uh, 31% is a pretty small uh, amount of shared symbolism for two hand-based languages that are being used to reflect the same oral language. I thought that was pretty cool. That same site stated that in 2013, which is pretty dated, there were an official statement of 137 different sign languages. Pretty awesome. The next myth here, and 
like I said, there is sign exact or sign supported English where you hand and fingerspell each word as it would be spoken. The nature of these visual languages, uh, such as ASL, create a unique structure for how you can talk, right? It's this visual performance. And therefore, you don't need to be word for word. I might say, what is your name? However, I might only sign what your name is. So that it doesn't exactly, the point of the example is to show that it doesn't exactly follow English. Uh, certain terms that would be for context, but aren't necessary, are typically removed from the visual expressions. As I said, these are a structural language and it's three-dimensional. Another misconception that people often have is that sign language only involves the hands. And that's not true. Body language and even facial expression also have influences on how your nonverbal language is, for lack of a better term, heard or interpreted by the person watching it. When it comes to these myths and misconceptions, another big one which I've heard other people say is this idea that all deaf people sign. But it's not true. Approximately 90% of the children who are born deaf are born to verbal speaking parents. So because their parents speak, these children don't necessarily learn sign language. Uh, you have the colloquial implants now. A lot of people get those for their kids. So you have ones that are non-surgical for younger children, and then you have the implanted ones. And so these children don't necessarily need to learn sign language if they have other means to communicate. Other people, those who have lost their hearing over time, may find it more difficult, depending on their age and their own capacity to learn, but they might find it hard to learn a new language when they've lost their verbal communication because of deafness, whether it be from a sudden accident or natural hearing loss. So... Those types of people would typically prefer to read your lips and respond to you as best they can. Or notes. Notes are good. When it comes to kids specifically, though, the myth I hear most often is the idea that children's ability to learn spoken languages is hindered by them learning to sign. Plenty of studies out there show the opposite is true. Just like learning a second verbal language, those studies have shown that learning a nonverbal language has the same positive effects uh, towards the growth and development of the child, uh, their brain, and improves their overall memory, which I I knew that about bilingualism, but at the same time, I had forgotten about it, which is funny, because that would be a memory issue. <laughs> you folks may also remember me mentioning in the f season one uh, how my oldest boy learned to express his emotions. What worked well for him was to add an extra step 
to uh, slow his brain down, to give him the time to process what he was feeling. Um, quick little review. Uh, we assign specific emotions to numbers. I'm a number one Carter. I'm a number two Carter. I'm a number three Carter. What do those numbers mean? Well, it's this emotion. It's that emotion. It's this. Now, Carter, Carter does have ADHD. So there is a need for slowing things down. But he does enjoy to use sign as well. Uh, we recently were using uh, finger spelling, which is not necessarily considered sign language because you're not working on speech, but parts of it. Anyways, to, we were using this to help him learn to spell words for his uh, written school spelling. And over one weekend, we had a list of words. At the start of the weekend, really had a hard time. We used the finger spelling, and he had all those words done down pat over the weekend. It was fun. I really enjoyed finding different ways to uh, test him on it, you know. Me, finger spelling, and him saying what letter it is. Or him having to say the right letter before I would finger spell it for him and having him uh, repeat the sign back to me. With my youngest boy, uh, we started sign with, you know, simple words, milk, mom, dad, those common early baby words that we want to use. And we all kind of start teaching our kids at a natural commonness. I don't want to say common sense, but, you know. And, like, to be honest, Odin has moved away from always showing his signs, and it's kind of obvious that he is showing a preference towards spoken language now. He's almost two. Um, and that is primarily an example thing, because we don't sign all the time either. However, there was a point where he only used to sign, and it was great, because he didn't know any words, but he could tell us if he needed milk. He could tell us who he wanted, right? If he wanted comfort and that kind of stuff. So it, it was cool that way. Um, he never really did request a diaper change with signs. And even though he can say those words now, he still doesn't. He often talks about poop, but there isn't any. Very confusing. During the stage, though, in between that, where he was transitioning from nonverbal to verbal communication, uh, he very quickly picked up on the words for the signs he knew because he connected them to that. This means that. That means this word. Okay, so that word means that. And it's really quite impressive how the human brain can do that. So those are some examples of myths. And why they don't work, <laughs> why they're wrong. So let's move ourselves to the different types of sign, which I kind of already talked about. Globally, there are many different sign languages. I believe I said 137. Here in North America, it gets a little bit complicated with both the United States and Canada using sign exact for educational purposes, or ASL, as official languages for their deaf communities. Then above that, we have PSE, or Pigeon Signed English, also sometimes just called Signed English, which is confusing to me. But what this is, is it is actually a mixture of Sign Exact and American Sign Language. It takes the signs of ASL, but follows the English word order 
like you would see in sign exact. This reminds me of uh, when I was living in Holland in the Netherlands. The further north you went, the more Germanic the voices and the pronunciations got because you were moving closer to Germany. So you had this more German dialect. As you went more south, you had more of a French dialect and expressionism in the Dutch. And as you went to the main touristy areas in around Amsterdam, very much uh, Anglified. Uh, a lot of English words being used in place of words that would require more effort <laughs> to use the uh, Netherlands words. So this does kind of remind me of this when I talk about these three adaptations of sign language in North America. Additionally, uh, sign exact expands on the nonverbal ASL signs to express synonyms as well as prefixes and suffixes uh, for English speaking children of er, derp. <laughs> for English speaking parents of children, this version is most likely to be the one that you would be most comfortable teaching to your child as it is English on the hands versus a new language, which is what ASL is. It is a new language. While it is good to teach it to your children and learn it yourself, if you speak English primarily, it's probably going to be easier to keep it straight in your head with sign exact. Pigeon sign English. Or some moderate variation of it could arise potentially when you learn a sign or a gesture from ASL that you prefer over an elongated section of sign exact, maybe for a common phrase. So you find it easier to use it. So if you and everybody else that you do sign with decide to start using that ASL expression for that common English expression in your sign exact English style, that is a dialected version of pigeon signed English. And as something becomes more common and spreads amongst the community and you have a whole bunch of people, well, it's pretty safe to say it's a version of pigeon signed English, right? So, pretty easy, right? North America has ASL as its official language in both Canada and the United States. And we use sign exact because it's easier for us speaking people to learn. Makes sense. And then sometimes those two things come together as their love child, and we call that PSE, or Pigeon Signed English. Why there's a pigeon involved, I have no idea. Nobody explained that in all the notes I read. But wait, there's more. Before we move on, in Canada, we also have a regional dialect of sign called MSL, or Maritimes Sign Language. And that is not at all shocking considering the majority of Canada treat the way East Coasters speak English as though it's its own language too. So it makes sense that they would have their own variation on sign language. Newfoundlandese hand gestures. Who'd have thought? Beyond that, Canada also has its own official sign for its French communities, called, and prepare for me to butcher this, La Langue des Signes Quebecois, or LSQ, which is, as a country who is nationally bilingual, 
it makes sense that we would have a French side to our deaf communities as well. I thought it was cool. Also found it interesting that they don't use French sign language. They have their own Quebecois sign language. Now, if you're curious about where you might use ASL versus SEE when you're communicating with a hearing impaired, hearing impaired person, the example I found suggested that sign exact is best suited for a classroom setting where the structure of sentences used is the emphasis. So like in an English class or a social studies class, you probably want to be very particular about how you say things. So it makes sense to follow the English language to get those prefixes, suffixes, and synonyms. Again, um, also sign exact works best for people who have lost their hearing over time or from, from an accident where they already knew English because it's easier for us to follow around follow along as English speakers. American Sign Language works as its own language for the deaf community, but in a classroom setting fits really well with sciences, where the focus is on the concept or the content of the topic, more so than it is about the way we're going to talk about it. And that's how you can Think of it as a way why you'd want to learn both and where they would be most likely to be used, right? Next on our curriculum for the day is the benefits of learning sign language, which in a way we've already kind of touched on, at least how it's benefited my kids uh, with giving Carter the extra step to slow down, and so he can clearly spell his written and words and his verbal words. Or with Odin being able to communicate at all. And he was only seven, eight months old when he first started signing. So um, that's didn't really start talking till 10, 11 months, which is a little bit early. Some kids are well and past their first year marker before they start really talking. But having older siblings does help with that. But the biggest thing I found with regards to how learning sign languages benefits those who can communicate verbally is in that it lends us the ability to empower those who are hearing impaired. How so? Imagine for a minute that you were in a foreign country where no one speaks your language and you need help. You go from person to person searching for it, but no one understands you. You cannot find help. Now imagine that you find someone who speaks your language. Think about how that would feel, that relief. And I bet being the person able to help someone who's in need would feel pretty damn good too. And yes, I realize I just gave you this worst case scenario as the example, but I want to drive this point home. At the very least, you could give a deaf member of your community an expanded social cir circle. There are more and more statistics about how as a society we're all getting lonelier, even though we're more connected than we've ever been. Imagine how nice it would be as a person who is a minority 
to be able to communicate with someone new. That'd be pretty cool. Now, as the language is physically expressive as people do words and stuff, right? This means that you can take your verbal communication and kind of turn it into a performance that can captivate others. I really encourage you guys to go on YouTube and just look at uh, videos of sign language performers for music. It's really cool to watch. <laughs> and it is a, a performance all its own. Go check that out. And to take that a little bit further, how many of you talk with your hands flailing about like I do? Okay. Imagine putting those drink spillers to work, actually telling the story and moving with purpose. I do it. I'm the spilly talker. Imagine how that would be to know that your hands are adding to your story, not just to your personal space bubble. Now in the links, I'm going to have in the description uh, of this episode, a TEDx talk from a deaf man named Neil DeMarco. Go and watch it. That's your homework assignment for today. But in that, he tells a story which helps make the next benefit very obvious. Um, I'm not really sure if that's the right word I'm looking for here. Heck if I know. Regardless, imagine being able to truly read body language. As I mentioned, the way a person uses their body and even their face is, for most forms of sign language, part of it, not just the hands. And I know from taking different classes that body language does speak more to people than the words we use. But we're picking them up on those things as verbal speakers subconsciously because we hear and we see them talking. So we focus on that because it's a double, st double stimulus. We don't focus on their body, but our brain does see how a person's body positioning is. So sign language will bring that to the foreground of your thought. You'll be able to pick up more on how they're standing, how their arms are positioned, uh, how their face is contorted, which in turn should or would make us more aware over time of our own body language, opening us up to ensuring that we are able to effectively communicate to everyone, whether they can hear us or not. The coolest reason, as far as being a parent is, the ability to have silent conversations. You hear what I did there? Uh, I'm funny. You laughed. If you didn't laugh, well, oh well. <laughs> The fact is that kids love the idea of being able to tell you something silently or from across the room without the whole world knowing. Just at the start of this month, my children had their Christmas concert and we were able to sign ASL, I love you, 
and have our kids sign it back to us through the crowd. And if you are in the party hardy age group, this could be a way to check on your friends from across the room without yelling or obviously whispering about the situation at hand. From a more professional benefit, just like any other language, there would also be the opportunity to act as an interpreter if you became fluent enough in sign language. There may even be opportunities within your current line of work that you would have never thought to look for if it weren't for having that skill set. Now, imagine learning how to communicate without words while well, you still can use words. And then having that skill set as you get older and you may lose your hearing or even vocal function over time. Wouldn't it be great if your family had a clear and rich, engaging way to communicate with you and involve you in their lives even if you can't hear what's going on. That sounds pretty cool to me. It actually brings up a funny story. I know a family that teaches their dogs signs for all their commands, just in case the dogs go deaf. And that makes sense. A hearing problem, depending on the breed of the dog, is very common, actually, especially as they get older. So doesn't it also make sense that we prepare ourselves in the same way? There are plenty of situations where being able to communicate silently would be great. Through glass underwater, across a room like we already mentioned. The idea that learning this is a second language that benefits your brain, the same as knowing a second verbal language, but with the added dimension of a visual three-dimensional expression. That is amazing. Then there is the idea that you could be able to help someone in need. That is also cool. Even if the idea that you could learn more than one sign language isn't intriguing to you, it is to me. The fact that I could learn ASL, BSL, Auslan, or, you know, being a uh, Canadian having a bilingual national identity. I am by no means fluent in French, but I do tend to use what I do know mixed into my English. Um, my mother's family is Dutch, so I do have random Netherlands uh, speech in there as well. And I would love to add those signs, those expressions, signed in the variations of those languages, whether it be FSL or LSQ for the French, and I'm not really sure what the Netherlands would call there, probably NSL would make sense. But to have the ability to sign in those languages where I use those languages in my verbal communication, that's, that's pretty cool. I think. Maybe I'm nuts. Let me know. And I can tell you what, something here. What the preparation of this lesson has really helped do, it's helped ramp up my desire to learn more sign. And it's also helped me find some interesting resources. The best of those I will be sharing with you guys. Uh, again, links to everything I found to be useful will be in the description of this episode. But just to give you a heads up as to what you might be finding, there is uh, a couple Amazon links to products I use. One is a set of flashcards. 
One is uh, a book I have. Then there are one, two, three, four, five, yeah, five websites with articles that I used to build this episode. And the last link I'm going to share with you guys is a direct link to the TEDx talk that I mentioned previously. Question of the week. I, I'm not sure I like that one yet, so you guys let me know what you think about that. That is not your question of the week, though. However, the question of the week is, what do you guys think of the idea of learning to sign? Obviously, I'm all for it. And I wish that I lived where learning from a native speaker, for lack of a better term, uh, was an easier task. So that I wouldn't just be like, oh, I'll just talk because it's easier and that's what I know. But to have to be forced to learn and take advantage of that and use my time wisely to learn it, that, that would be awesome. As with every episode, guys, I look forward to your feedback. So please rate the show on whatever podcast app you may be listening to or leave a review there. Even drop me a line down in the comments down below the bridge where all the trolls live in the YouTube comments section. You guys, as always, can email me crown so crown e s s zero at gmail.com and you guys can find me on Twitter at crownesso c-r-o-w-n-e-s-s-0 if you found this class informative share it with your friends and see what they think of it until next class guys be sure to check out these suggested classes over here educate yourself with another jazz class.